So, um, hello and uh, welcome everybody to uh, this webinar today. My name is Steve Dunn and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this Advantage Travel Partnership and Win webinar, which today is going to be taking a very close look at the global impact that uh, COVID-19 has had on the travel management uh, sector generally across the globe and the business travel community specifically um, in various regions of the world. And uh, we'll be joined by a panel from uh, across the globe that will be able to give us all their own uh, perspectives. Um, Advantage Travel Partnership is uh, one of the UK's largest independent travel uh, agency groups um, and the Advantage Business Travel um, TMC membership are each independently owned. Uh, but as a collective, they produce um, around £3.85 billion worth of business travel sales um, each year, making Advantage uh, TMC members quite literally uh, experts in every aspect of the business and corporate uh, travel sector. Uh, WIN, the other name that I just uh, mentioned, um, is the global arm of Advantage with over 6,000 global uh, corporate travel specialist members uh, located in 70 countries. Uh, and they provide local service excellence using global uh, products and technology. But we'll hear more about that in just a moment's time. Now, if you've been monitoring uh, the global news around the COVID-19 pandemic, then uh, like me, you are probably beginning to feel that we're seeing a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, um, that the world is easing itself gently back into a semblance of normality as we are starting in some regions of the world to see the first signs of travel starting to return. Um, I say in some parts of the world um, and definitely wherever we are in the world we're getting a sense of the easing of lockdown uh, restrictions and the re rebooting if you like of commercial activity again um, in various different stages across various different parts of the world. Now over the next hour you will hear from um, some of the members of WIN and uh, Advantage um, as they're going to share their perspective and their experiences of how the industry is faring in their local markets, uh, many of which of course feed into other sectors, and how they're beginning to, ret uh, to manage the process of a return uh, to travel. And hopefully we'll pick up some insights that will be as useful in your sector as it is or has proven to be in theirs. Uh, we'll also discuss other uh, um, industry uh, um, aspects such as uh, the need to support travellers when borders open and various things of that nature. Now I should also point out just before we go any further that what we really want to do is make this uh, session as interactive as we possibly can. Uh, we want to get you, the viewer, so to speak, uh, as involved. So if you've got a question or a comment that you would like to address to any of our panel members during the course of the hour, uh, please feel free to use the uh, question uh, facility at the foot of your screen. Um, I always feel a bit cheeky now because everyone's been Zooming for so long now. We're all probably pretty experts at it, but uh, just ask via the question uh, format there. What you do get in these uh, webinars, because we're not all in the same room, is that some people will often ask very similar questions. And what we'll do there is rather than attach your name to a question, we may group your question in with one or two others because they, they sound fairly similar or they're of a, a similar theme. But we will try and get through as many of those as we can. So uh, let's get on to uh, the business of the day and joining me today we've got four panel members. Three of them are from uh, three different continents and then uh, we've got Julia uh, from here in the UK. Firstly uh, we have uh, Mark Walton. Mark is um, an executive vice president strategy for options travel in the United States. Uh, Mark is an industry expert in the field of corporate travel management and uh, all the related areas to that particular uh, uh, sector. Uh, we're also joined by Mara Bidshar, who's the general manager of Mutaiga uh, Travel in Kenya. Um, and they're, the, uh, they're Kenya's leading travel management company out there, I think it's safe to say. Alongside Myra, we have Diego Carvello, who is the managing partner of Travel Care in Portugal. Uh, travel Care is an agency that specializes in personalized corporate travel services, but they'll tell us more about their business and their market 
in just a second. And finally, the fourth uh, uh, um, name on the, uh, the list is uh, Julia Lebeau Syad, CEO of Advantage Travel Partnership, a familiar face to many of us um, here on this particular webinar. Julia has the responsibility for running uh, the business of the Advantage Travel Partnership on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as developing the strategy and the vision for the company. So, first of all, welcome to uh, all our panelists uh, this afternoon. I'm sure we're going to be uh, full of great uh, uh, debate and uh, uh, lots of insight. Um, and let me start, if I may, by uh, asking Julia if uh, I, I said a little bit about uh, Advantage and Win there, but if you'd like to tell us a little bit more about the workings and, and how that all fits together. Yes, hi, thank you, Stephen. Good afternoon to everyone and uh, good morning to Mark. So, um, yeah, um, thank you for that. So, Advantage is the, the UK's largest consortium. We specialise in business and leisure. Um, we provide services and content to members to, to enable them to, to run really commercially sound businesses. Um, the relationship with Wynn started many, many years ago where um, we felt actually as a, as a um, siloed business in the UK, one of the areas that we really felt could um, help members in their business transactions was to unite forces with global players and, and, and different counterparts across the, across the world. So that's kind of morphed into Win over the years. Win is a wholly owned subsidiary of Advantage and we bought the business uh, three years ago now. Um, and really in those few years, what we've managed to do is really unite the membership. We're represented, as you say, in over 70 countries. Obviously, our, our members, some of our members are here represented today. Um, and the purpose is, is really twofold. One, it's, um, it's about doing business together and working through how we can work with each other with, um, with the various corporate accounts through our membership to, to help everybody um, transact globally. Um, and also to, and also to three things actually. So sharing, sharing best practice is also extremely important. Um, and actually throughout this crisis, what we have found is our weekly global course has, has really helped to share useful insights so that we can all start to plan and, and think ahead. Um, but it's also about content. So what is the content that we can provide um, to help our members um, that provides a common basis for all, all of us in our marketplaces? So um, so the business, the business has um, grown significantly. We're representing 70 countries and, and we will continue to grow. And, and in fact, we brought on during this last two months, we, we have recruited um, a couple of new members, one in Turkey also, who actually find that now more than ever, they want to be part of a global network where they where sharing best practices is going to become increasingly important. Now, you just mentioned uh, um, now more than ever. The, uh, the, the, the partner you've just been talking about wanting to get involved with Win has has Win been doing anything specifically during COVID nineteen? Um, yeah, so one of the things that we've we've held regular calls with all the partners, um, and I think a lot of the, lot of um, the the um, our, our partners here have been on those calls. Um, and again, really trying to understand, you know, you know, where the UK is in comparison to some of the other um, partners is we we are clearly slightly behind. So actually, how can we start to learn? How can we start to put in place the processes that um, our other partners have, have had the opportunity to think ahead of? Um, so, and so keeping each other informed, working really closely together, um, but actually also start to think ahead. So what, what are we going to have to do differently? Um, what are we going to have to um, provide as part of our portfolio moving forward? Um, and actually being able to do that across the, across the globe is, is paramount and, and actually helping us to shape our strategy as we move forward. Okay. And is there any uh, uh, particular changes that we're going to see as we come out of, uh, from the wind perspective and this working together on a global uh, 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 backdrop. Is there anything we're specifically going to see um, as we come out of uh, this period? Yeah, Steve, I think really for, for, for me and also for the team, what this has really showed us is the importance of continuing to invest in WIN. Um, the significant importance of an independent TMC global network is fundamental, I think, for, for all of us moving forward. Um, I think also the ability to get into new markets um, and understand those markets better. Now, um, you know, for a lot of, a lot of corporates you know they're you know they're um you know the duty care the practices that they are going to need supporting um is going to change as it will for all of us we all travel um so actually how can we use the network to be able to confidently provide our corporates through our tmcs the ability to consider doing things differently so how do we educate them and how do we use the network to learn from our experiences to help educate our 
the buyers, the suppliers, all of all of all the whole chain, the whole ecosystem to think very differently. Um, but I think also um, the supply chain is exceptionally important. So we have to now be able to unilaterally um, work with our suppliers on common goals that are required in that in that traveler pro traveler process, um, and understand what are they going to put in place so that we can confidently provide our our TMCs and our travelers with the information that they're going to need around you know, hygiene standards, com common, um, you know, common goals they're all going to need to kind of work towards. Excellent. And of course, this webinar is a classic example of how you can share information and insights. Um, Mark, let's uh, uh, start with you, if we may, um, and get the, the North American uh, uh, perspective on uh, what you're currently going through and what you've come from. So if you can give us a feel in terms of uh, the markets, just so we can all get familiar with it, uh, in terms of the micro and macro, if you can tell us a little bit about your own business and then a little bit about the, uh, uh, the sector and the field you're operating in at the right, at, right at the moment. And if you could just tell us what it was like before the pandemic hit, and what it's been like during the pandemic so we get a sense of scale of what you've had to deal with sure and and uh good morning afternoon evening everybody uh, around the world and appreciate the opportunity to to, uh, to be with you today i'm coming to you from the chicago area in uh, of course the middle of the united states it's a beautiful day here about 75 fahrenheit and 24 celsius for those of you uh in the celsius world and uh so so our business, uh, Options Travel, travel management company, have been in business for about 28 years. We are uh, um, a company who has spread our wings across the globe, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, for about 24 of those 28 years, we've been a pretty traditional travel management company. Um, however, about four years ago, we had a, a, a very significant expansion of our business in a number of different ways. Uh, we grew our own internal IT organization, developed some of our own travel technology uh, groups and meetings tool that um, we're marketing um, across the world now. Um, but important to this group is that we started an expansion globally, multinationally, uh, developed our own global 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation, multilingual operation, um, so we can cover essentially all parts of the world, which is when we partnered with the WIN Group. Um, we developed our own operation in partnerships with some of the wind partners that now allow us to operate in 16 countries. And uh, we also take the um, advantage of, of, of working with other wind partners around the world um, as we can. And we certainly see that part of our business um, expanding quite greatly. As far as the um, kind of the, the picture of the, the North American market in terms of where we were and where we are, um, in terms of where we were, I mean, we were on a, on a fast track, as I was just explaining, especially on a, a multinational expansion. And, um, and of course, that came to a pretty much screeching halt uh, about three months ago. Um, incredibly, uh, time flies. But um, our business, uh, very similarly to other businesses around the world, um, you know, went from 100 to about um, 3 to 5 percent of what we were doing. Um, today in the in the U.S., um, you're starting to see the marketplace open up. Um, of course, it's a big country, and and there's 50 states, and different states have their own individual policies around how their businesses are reopening. And clearly, that, those have an impact on travel as it relates to hotel openings and obviously the air picture and so forth and so on. So, um, what the good news is. And um, I'd like to take a, an optimistic approach to the marketplace. And some of you might know that um, I wrote an article, an op-ed, not too long ago in, in Business Travel News that was published um, that talked about taking a more optimistic view of, of, of the future and what's going on. Um, I had seen too many articles and been in too many discussions about you know, people suggesting that this business is not going to come back for potentially years. And, um, and, and the article really pointed out that if enough people speak in that, in that framework, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy that eventually um, other companies will fall in step. So, um, you know, clearly um, I think that we take an, an educated and, you know, an eye-open approach to the marketplace and understand the realities. Um, but we are planning proactively for um, the future. And that means helping our clients um, come back into the marketplace. So we're taking a number of steps um, and, the, and, the, and the good news in terms of the result of some of those steps are we're seeing business 
um, come alive again. So last week um, we were back up to um, our, our peak day was about 20% of what we were year on year, um, which is obviously a, quite a significant improvement. So, so, so good news ahead. And, and is there, uh, forgive me for not knowing this, but uh, are there travel restrictions outside of domestic travel? Is there travel restrictions for Americans? There are, there are no travel restrictions in terms of um, specifically traveling within the states or outside of the states to countries that allow um, entry of, of U.S. citizens. Um, but clearly there's, there's impediments to, to travel, um, but no restrictions. Okay. All right. Well, we'll come back and examine some of the things you've, uh, uh, you've said there, but I'm very much in, uh, um, in the mood for optimism. So uh, having an optimist on board is, is terrific. So you keep that, uh, that spirit alive for the rest of the, uh, uh, the webinar. Let's move to uh, uh, Myra. Now, Myra, um, you know, you're the biggest or one of the leading, should I say, uh, East African uh, TMCs. What's your take on, on uh, the market? And, and let's start with you giving us a, a, an idea of your business the size of it, and of course, the size of uh, uh, business travel in East Africa. Okay, so I'm based, good afternoon, everybody, morning to some people and evening to some. We're based in Kenya, and we also have a sister company in South Sudan, Juba. Oh, wow. And we have been operating for the last 30 years. We're a um, travel management company. Obviously, we started as a leisure company, but then eventually over the years moved to a, a travel management company and have been that for a number of years. Over here, we've had, well, I can't say a lockdown, but the airspace has been closed from the middle of March and we haven't had any flights or anything operating. So we have no flights coming in except for repatriation flights, uh, which people come on. So when they did stop the um, airspace, they did still allow our national carrier to bring back people or wherever they were. And when they did come in, they had to have people stay in um, government facilities. So the government identified some facilities for quarantine and they stayed there. Uh, we're on a curfew from uh, seven in the evening till five in the morning. Unfortunately, in this country, we can't do a lockdown. We just can't, the government can't afford to sustain it. And we have people who are really hand to mouth. So they need to go out and work. So if they did that, um, it wouldn't, sustain this country at all, that we would have a lot more people worse off than they are. Um, we're just waiting to see when the skies open, when the airlines open. Today I was uh, in a webinar and they, they seem to be quite positive and hoping that it will open middle of June. So we are hoping by then, and then that means all international flights come back and we have uh, business resuming. Well, that's not too bad, that's what, two? two and a half weeks, something like that. So yes, uh, yes exactly. And our curfew ends around the 6th of June, we're hoping um, it doesn't get extended. But even if it does get extended and the flights open up, there will still be some sort of waivers. And when they come back, is there a feel for whether that will be sort of intra-Africa uh, before it goes wider? or It'll it start through? with definitely intra-Africa, but there are international flights that want to fly in at least once or twice a week. So it should be Europe, um, Middle East, Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay. And let's turn to Diego. Um, what is the uh, situation in Portugal uh, uh, currently, but also if you can give us an idea of what business travel was like before all this happened um, and what it's like now and how you've been managing, that would be terrific. Um, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity to speak at this webinar with, with my fellow partners of uh, Win and Advantage. And to and hello to everyone who, who is watching. Uh, well, Portugal has been in a lockdown since mid-March. Uh, our government acted very, very quickly, um, considering what happened in Spain and Italy, which are, uh, especially Spain, which is our neighbor country and main um, trade partner. And so they acted very quickly and enforced the lockdown. So everything was closed from mid-March up until almost the end of May, uh, which means that uh, restaurants, hotels, um, airports, everything was closed and people were asked to stay home, except for those that were uh, deemed as essential workers. I'm talking about uh, healthcare workers, uh, pharmacies, uh, grocery stores, etc. Um, the, um, 
the business um, the business travel market in Portugal has been growing uh, for the past few years. Um, as is common knowledge, Portugal had a financial crisis in 2011, and we started to come out of that um, that crisis a few years ago. And uh, 2019 was one of the best years in the past uh, decade or so. Uh, so uh, business travel was uh, was growing, also because uh, companies to go out of recession and to um, and to have more business uh, started to focus themselves much more outside of Portugal than inside. So internationalization was very important for many different sectors. Also, tourism grew a lot. So. The, the old business business travel market was growing a lot. Uh, at this moment, it has completely stopped. Um, we are noticing that corporates want to travel again. They are just waiting for the restrictions to be lifted, and to airlines to start uh, flying again, so that they can they can resume travel because they have ongoing projects and they have strategic business partners outside of Portugal that, that they need to. Um, to visit and they need to visit the sites and do technical visits and etc. So it's very important for them to, to, to resume traveling. And is there a, a feel, Diego, for when it may come back? Is there, you know, Mia said, uh, uh, Mira said uh, mid-June could be a possibility in East Africa. What would it be like for you? Yeah, it will be almost the same here. Uh, we have airlines that are planning to begin traveling in the beginning of June. Uh, others a bit later, we, we, we won't have as many um, slots as before. So instead of having uh, daily flights or uh, for a, a certain destination, they might have once a week. So, but it's a, it's a start. And I, I feel, and from the talks that we've had with different airlines, that if the airplanes are full and um, there is not a spike in new uh, COVID cases, then they, they will uh, open up new slots um, very quickly. Okay, so I think the, uh, uh, the feel of optimism is that, you know, there is a bit of a light there, even if it's a tiny little chink in the door, but we could be back traveling uh, maybe for the mid-summer. Um, let me ask um, each of you, and again, we'll start with Mark if, if we may, but it will be for, for everybody, um, which is that, you know, Mark has said his business went from 100% to I think it's three to 5%, and now it's uh, appearing to come back. Um, and uh, um, again, the guys have seen their business literally grind to a halt in, in various different aspects. What are you each doing for uh, uh, your businesses in terms of planning for the restart of travel? You know, are you recalling staff? Are you going to be opening offices again? Are you, I mean, what are you going to be doing? And also, how are you going to um, uh, um, stimulate uh, uh, your clients? Because again, of course, they may uh, uh, feel reticent about traveling in the early days. Let's start with you, Mark. Yeah, so, so as far as the, uh, the client activity, um, we're doing quite a lot. Uh, first of all, we, we, we kept on our entire client services organization from the very beginning of this and until now. Uh, we did go on reduced hours, but everybody is, is still on board. Uh, we had a, we had a, a very positive um, you know, scenario with the U.S. government in the sense that the government provided um, some assistance to small businesses. So we're able to provide um, some financial um, assistance to enable us to support um, our employees um, for, uh, for a period of time. So um, we did have to furlough a number of them um, on the operations team, however, but, um, but we're still able to operate and, and, and increase our business and operate well, and we'll continue to call back as, as we can. Um, as far as though then the client activity through our account management organization, we're starting to work with our clients and developing a plan to, um, to, uh, to start up again. So um, we have, as an example, we're working with one client that they, they call it defining the full cycle of a business trip. And uh, um, they're, they're really looking at this from an A to Z type of perspective and, you know, all aspects of travel and, and uh, one of the ideas that came out of that discussion, and I've mentioned this to a number of people who, who picked up on it and thought it was very positive, is for them to do a, uh, um, a sort of a counseling session, if you will, for all of their travelers in their company um, prior to them resuming travel. So that 
it's not determined yet exactly how that will be done, whether it be in small groups or individuals or by a, a live or a video or an animated video. Uh, but it'll probably be something on the ladder, a, a video of some sort that everybody will be required to view prior to embarking on a, on a trip again. Other things that we're doing internally, um, I, I think there was a mention earlier of, of duty of care. Uh, duty of care is something in the, in the United States that lags far behind other parts of the world, I think especially in the UK. Um, we needed to catch up on that and we will, um, certainly partially as a result of this pandemic um, ourselves as a company um, we are beefing up our ability to support clients in any area of duty care that they want um, so everything from um, just informational outreaches and proactive ability to um, point out any issues anywhere in the world um, able to um, populate mobile apps that are providing immediate information to individual travelers allow them to have immediate contact to us um, should they need assistance, obviously a locator service so we know where they are anywhere in the world, uh, so forth and so on. But providing additional services in terms of medical information, evacuation, so forth and so on. So, so quite a lot there as it relates to, you know, how we're go changes that we're going to make um, and how we support clients going forward. Excellent. And, and just one question, uh, uh, Mark, in terms of the phasing of your business coming back to to full life where, where do you think you're going to be statistically is it going to go from having 25 percent of your workforce back 50 75 100 i mean and and over what time span or is that too difficult a question to answer at this stage well i'll tell you how we how we have approached it um we've we've done a forecast and you know essentially the forecast there's a there's a mid-range and there's a worst case and a best case scenario and in the, in the mid range, if you will, um, we're forecasting at the end of the 12 month period from the beginning of this till that 12 month period that we'll be, we'll be back, well, higher than we were um, at, the, at the start, but, um, uh, but roughly 50% of our annualized volume um, for that 12 month period from a, from a prior year. So that's, that's what we're estimating. Um, you know, uh, again, there's a there's a worst case and a best case to that, but um, but so far the trends seem to to line up pretty closely to to that analysis that we put together. Excellent. Okay, so um, Myra, let's turn uh, uh, to you and what your plans for your business uh, with travel reemerging, maybe as you say in mid uh, June. And also, if I could just add in there, what have you been doing as a business in terms of keeping yourself front of mind with your customers? I mean, what kind of account management do you do during a pandemic in East Africa? Yes. So at the moment, all my staff are at home. In fact, they've been at home from the 26th of March. We, a lot of them had leave days, so we actually asked them to take leave. Uh, some who didn't have leave days, but we're still, I mean, because there was really nothing they could do in the office. So it was better that they stay at home and also trying to maintain that social distance. Uh, but they have, everybody has been getting in touch with their clients, just keeping them or at least letting them know we're there for them. We've done a video, which I, I'll share with you guys, um, uh, the, just to let them know we're missing them. We're, so we're constantly in touch with our clients, trying to just let them know we're there. On social media, we've been doing a lot of marketing, making, just advising people on what to do while you're at home, do some exercise, do some cooking. So we're giving recipes out, we're giving out some exercises that they can do. Just, I mean, obviously trying to do something different from what everybody else is doing, because there is really no travel that we can sell. There are repatriation flights. Uh, again, those, we can just market them, but they're sold directly through the airline. We've had a couple of those, um, yeah. yeah. And in regards to um, business coming back when it does, we won't have everybody come into the office immediately. We'll start slowly, slowly, and then see how it goes. And when we need everybody in, we'll get everybody in. Yeah, I think it's a learning process for, for everybody, really, isn't it? Yeah. Although, of course, you could uh, have your clients flying around the world in food in, the, in terms of all the recipes you've been sending out. Exactly. Um, <laughs> thank you. Diego, what's, uh, uh, what, what are you doing to prepare for when business comes back, hopefully next month? Well, we've been, our offices uh, have, have been closed during the lockdown, but we opened a few weeks ago. 
only at 10%. So we don't, we try not to have too many people um, at the office at the same time. Um, but we've always been working and we have always been uh, preparing ourselves. Even when people were staying at home, they were always trying to, to be up to date with all the, the, the new restrictions, the new rules, everything that has changed and it changes so much and very, and so quickly. And today you see the regulations and tomorrow they are di totally different in yeah. different parts of the globe. So they are always changing. So we need to be always prepared. So I think that this work of preparing ourselves has, has begun before the lockdown. Uh, when we started repatriating uh, people that were um, traveling, that were working uh, outside of Portugal, they needed to come back. And uh, we started working at that time. And we haven't we haven't stopped. We are always um, reading and trying to be in contact with the authorities in many different countries and with the Portuguese embassies in many different countries as well. So I think that the most important thing is that we need to to be partners with our clients. They 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 already saw us as partners, but now we need to strengthen that relationship, and we are strengthening it. Um, because we are almost part of their organization. We are very, very important. Uh, when they will start to travel and, um, and they need to trust us, and we are working hard to, to gain that trust or to keep that trust at, at yeah. least. I think, I think the balance, of course, is that you, you, you get the communications right with your clients during this period where they can't really do very much because you don't want to perhaps be too annoying that you're contacting them every day when there's very little can be done, but you don't want to drop off their radar. Um, Julia, uh, uh, what is, uh, just so that we sort of square the circle, really, what is the, uh, uh, the initiatives coming out of Advantage and, and maybe win as well in terms of uh, uh, keeping business travel alive during this period? And what are we doing to prepare for when business travel does come back in the UK? Oh, Julia, you're on mute. Should know by now, really, shouldn't I? Um, <laughs> Have to resolve. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I touch on Advantage first, so for, for all those Advantage members, and we, we've got a 120 UK business travel members, as you refer to, just under four billion pounds worth of turnover a year. So. And for the 120 business travel members that are part of Advantage, we have been um, making sure they get daily communication right the way through. So from the 16th of March, uh, yeah, middle of March, when we went into lockdown, we've had daily communications and, and they start off with video communications that myself and my team took part in. Yeah. Um, and that's ranged on all that's that's covered a whole range of different subjects. Um, also, we've maintained a COVID hub. Um, I think we've got to find a slightly sexier name for that, but it's a, a COVID hub on our intranet, which has provided our network with up-to-date regular information. And Diogo made a really good point because one of the issues that we've all been challenged with is the um, constantly changing guidelines that have come out of particularly the suppliers, but also from, from across the borders. So if you think from a, from a um, TMC's perspective, trying to keep up-to-date with all of that information has been a monumentous task. So. Um, what myself and the team have been trying to do is really try and consolidate that, making sure that it's um, presented in the manner that the members can go into the internet and find that information really easily um, and make sure that they can provide the, the communication, uh, the relevant communication to their TMCs. Um, similarly on WIN, so in, in WIN as part of the kind of global network, we have held our, um, our regular weekly calls with all the different network partners. We provide a global network news, so that goes out very regularly. And we've got a COVID hub on the internet also. So on, on the hub, again, it's sharing information from across the borders, but making sure that our partners um, can provide at a touch of a button some really useful updates. Um, and for me, this session is, is also really useful because the whole premise of whether it's advantage or win is about sharing and it's about understanding what do our network partners need to enable us to move to the next level and how do we make sure that we can all be travel ready as and when you know our borders our borders um, you know are open um, but making sure that our members and TMCs understand across the globe what the restrictions are because the minute our borders come down we, we've got a huge we've still got other issues that we have to deal with so how do we together make sure that we can present that information in a manner that enables our enables our corporates to, to um, 
have a manageable program, a, a, a managed program in place um, that we can help support them with and our members can help support them with. So I see very much, Steve, our, what we've been doing and our, and our role more so than ever before moving forward is that conduit of information and making sure that there is one source of, of reliable information that's very easily digestible that our partners, our TMCs in, in the UK can, can rely on. And um, um, what is your sense, uh, Julia, in terms of your members, both win and, and advantage, in the, in the use and the value that all these resources that you've put, such as the COVID hub, uh, uh, has that grown during the, uh, uh, the pandemic or was it hugely embraced at the start and then everyone's got used to life in COVID? You know, genuinely, uh, uh, genuinely, it's been, it, we continue to see more usage and um, we can see, you know, we can see how many members are accessing the data, accessing the stats right, right across, whether it's win or advantage. Um, and it's, it's ensured and it's made me um, commit to making sure that we, we continue doing what we're doing because it's, you know, we've, we've all, you know, have, have staff that we've had to furlough and we've got less resource, but all working twice as hard. So, um, but the fact that our members and our global partners are relying on this communication, finding it really useful, um, absolutely committed to do it. Um, I, think, I think the other um, really important point is here, we're all working very differently um, and actually making sure that we can help our partners think more dynamically by sharing information, um, working with our members about being more agile and being able to, we've, look, we've all, we've all gone from running the business in a particular way to overnight running it a different way. And our corporates are no different. So I think our experiences will really help us educate and work with our corporates moving and the buyers and the suppliers moving forward um, to really ensure that we can work together on, on, on a, a managed program that is fit for purpose for the, for the world that we're now going to be living in. That's terrific. And I, I think uh, associations like this really do become a value in periods uh, uh, that we're going through currently. Um, let me ask a question to, uh, to all of you. Um, now, you'll be aware as I am that the market is currently, or at least it seems to me, awash with uh, surveys, reports, forecasts, predictions, uh, often made by very impressive names like Deloitte, PwC, McKinsey, and so on and so forth. Um, and I was reading um, a survey from IATA, uh, for example, which had commissioned a, a survey itself of um, corporates. And this was back in April, so it's only a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that survey revealed that, uh, and I'm going to quote it here, 60% of respondents anticipate a return to travel within one or two months of containment of the COVID-19 pandemic, i.e. being under control. 40%. Uh, indicated that they would wait six months or more, mainly due to duty of care issues and therefore being very reticent about sending some of their uh, business people on travel. Um, and a further 69% um, said uh, or indicated that they could delay a return to business travel um, until their corporate financial situations and their budgets stabilised, uh, which is understandable. So what do we need to do, each of us in our markets, what do we need to do to get the business traveller personally confident about travelling again, and then the business travel buyer, the, 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 the corporate travel manager, if you like, um, commissioning travel so that their, their people can travel, given all these uh, uh, problems or, or other issues around budgets, uh, duty of care, and the business traveller themselves maybe still not being confident. So, Mark, can we start with you? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot there in that, in that question. And um, I, I think, I mean, obviously, um, if, if there are solutions relative to a vaccine or antivirals, I mean, that, that, that's a, a change um, that we're all, of course, anticipating and hoping for that will uh, hopefully immediately change things. But um, beyond that, I think the experiential side of this business um, is going to be important. Um, you know, we've had people in our company that have been on airplanes, and as more people um, are on airplanes and, and have a positive experience, um, you know, the, the, the rates of infection aren't increasing. I mean, that's all going to help bring, bring, bring companies and people back. But what, what we need to do, I think, as a, as a community, I mean, is... Is, is continue this effort of, of education and 
um, and training and provide, you know, the, the right tools for people to feel comfortable. So if they're comfortable knowing that um, they have all the information at hand, that they can get access to information that they need, that's going to go a long way. Um, and uh, probably like many people on this call, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time listening to other webinars and people, for example, from the hotel side of this business. And um, they're doing an amazing thing um, they, in terms of cleanliness program, um, also on the airline side. You know, every airline is going through this very enormous um, change in, in how they're cleaning airplanes um, after every trip in some cases. Um, so there's those elements. Those are um, some of the factual things that, that people can do to, to make travelers feel comfortable. The, the idea of leaving a seat empty in the middle or eventually even changing seat configurations to put up part, you know, partitions or whatnot. So, so all of this will help and it will move people back into the, uh, in, into the, um, the mode of travel. And do you find, because we've got it here in the UK, that uh, maybe some of the suppliers uh, um, are out of kilter with each other. So, for example, the middle seat missing uh, um, scenario you just painted. We have one no frills airline over here who's talked about bringing that in, and its biggest rival has said that's not possible to do and it doesn't work and all the rest of it. And then you've got uh, some of them saying that you can't do the deep cleaning in between a turnaround of of aircraft, mainly because it's probably against their business model, but. Do you find that some of the suppliers are out of kilter and that's confusing the travel buyers and the business traveler? Well, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, a process that, um, that the industry is going through right now. So one is they're looking, I think, at what, what the, the customer, the consumer will tolerate. And um, so you know, they, they obviously have to look at their own economics and, and they're gonna, that's going to be reflected in downstream and in, in pricing. So, um, you know, as they can put more people on the airplane and, and more people are going to sit on an airplane, um, you know, we'll see the economics reflect favorably in terms of prices. If that doesn't happen, we're going to potentially see it move the other direction. So I, I think, again, that's part of the experience. Um, there's nobody really knows for a fact um, today. Um, but at least from the U.S. carrier's perspective, we see more carriers than not. Um, adhering to this policy of, of at least for now keeping the seats open. Yeah, I think you're, you're you're absolutely right that nobody really knows the picture. I know for me, uh, I started to get very immune to the phrase the new normal because everyone was telling me what the new normal was going to be. That eventually I just uh, thought nobody really knows until it comes along. Um, Mira, what about uh, uh, you? What are you doing to to encourage um, business travellers to come back travelling and of course uh, uh, the buyer as well? Obviously, we are sharing with them the videos that the airlines is sharing with us and saying what, they're, what measures they're taking and how they're going to make sure that passenger is safe on board and even when they arrive at the destination. We have clients, obviously, who don't want to go into a country where they're going to be quarantined for 14 days because if they're going on business and then they have to go into quarantine for 14 days, it doesn't make sense to them. So we have those um, do So we're still waiting for those... Um, countries to revise their uh, quarantine rules and stuff like that. But, but clients, I, I, I think as, as a travel agent, we would, we would have to fly first to show them that, yes, we're confident enough to fly. Everything's fine. The airports are fine. Take videos or just share with them our experience of flying and let them know that, you know, it is, it is okay to fly. The planes are fine. The planes are clean. Um, yes, the seating in between probably, but when, when we speak to the local airline here or our national carrier, they said if they were to remove that middle seat, it's not viable for them to be flying. They might as well park their airplanes. Absolutely. Um, I'm your, not I'm sure how it is with the other airlines. Um, I, I think British Airways, um, if, just correct me if I'm wrong, said something similar, that if they were to remove that middle seat, um, it doesn't make sense for them to be flying. So a lot of the airlines will be saying that. And I think it also, when they had their meeting with IATA, it was a similar sort of thing because IATA, I think, was pushing it, saying you have to, you have to remove these seats and, um, or make space and social distancing on a plane, but the airlines were not up for it. So it's, it's us to really, um, yeah, teach the clients again and handhold probably. 
Uh, I like your style of leading from the front. I think that's a fantastic uh, example to everybody. It's something I hadn't thought of. Um, and I remember, I think it was Willie Walsh during the Volcano Ash crisis was on the first BA plane that left to prove to everybody everything was back to normal. And I always thought that was great leadership. So I think that's a terrific thing to, to, to do, Mara. Um, Diego, what about uh, uh, Portugal? How are you going to be uh, uh, coaxing people back to travel and getting travel uh, corporate buyers to, to uh, open their checkbooks? Um, well, Steve, um, taking a bit this, this conversation a bit back, um, regarding the survey, I, I think we need to to take these results with a with a pinch of salt, because it, as you said, it, it was made in April, so it was at the very peak of the pandemic. So everybody is very very pessimistic. So if you go and ask someone whose business is completely shut down if they will travel right away, if they will say no, most likely or they will they will tend to say no, because they are worried they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel, as we are seeing now. We, we are beginning to understand that uh, we, can, we can live with this virus. We need to learn to live with this virus, at least until there is a very effective treatment or a vaccine. Um, so well, people are starting to calm down and to understand that uh, life must go on. It will be a, a bit different than what it was before, but it, will, it, will, it must go on. We cannot be locked down in our houses for two or three years until a treatment is finally available to everyone or, or everyone is vaccinated. Uh, so travelers will, they, they, want to, they, want, they want to travel. And I, I separate two different markets. If it's leisure, people want to travel because they like it. And they, they're already trying to, at least in Portugal, it's what we, we experience. People want to, want to have their um, holidays as normal or as normal as it can be. And we'll see much more domestic uh, holidays this year than the normal. But people want to know when they can travel and when, can, when they can go to hotels and if the hotels are open and if they are serving breakfast, if they are serving food, if, there's, uh, if the pool is open, they are asking all these kind of questions. And corporates, as I said, Portugal is a, is a specific market, market because they want the corporates are... Um, they need to travel because they have the many, many partners outside. Uh, so they, they, will, they are looking to, to take all precautions that they can. And the duty of care is, is coming up um, with much more, important, much more importance now. Uh, but uh, I think it's a matter of, of time and to assure them that uh, it, if it is safe or not, and uh, what they can expect uh, when they reach the destination. Okay, excellent. Um, um, Julia, is there anything you'd like to add from a, a UK perspective? Uh, the only thing I wanted to add actually, so I think um, we've kind of referenced it there, you know, that, and you talked about the norm, what's the new normal? Well, you know, there isn't a new normal. We've got to learn to live with this. Um, we've got to learn to live with COVID because it's going to be with us. It's, it's not going anywhere, unfortunately. So I, I honestly believe that TMCs, um, independent TMCs have a, an even bigger opportunity now than they ever have before. Um, it's always been about personalization and, and you know, the lack of consistency, whether that's by country in terms of borders, in terms of suppliers, that's not going to go away. We're not going to get consistency. So how can a TMC um, help? And, and you know, that's something where Advantage and Wing can help. But how can we help um, provide that level of information that enables a TMC to provide um, that confidence to their corporates and, the, and their travelers? Um, how do we help them understand hygiene processes? Um, what alternative modes of transport are there? So, you know, instead of getting into a, I don't know, a taxi, private chauffeur tri driver, or, or et cetera. So there are different, I, I think it's incumbent on us to be more, cre be creative. And we are a creative um, industry. Um, be creative and ensure that we can continue adding value to the buyers and the corporates uh, around new processes that, and new content. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about our hotel program and, and, and the partners on the call use the hotel program and it's, it's, and it, and it's growing and we are um, revolutionizing it and, and it will grow even further. But actually, how do we ensure working with our suppliers in providing that content to the TMC community that it's fit for purpose in this new world that we're living in? So actually, it's, I'm optimistic and there, there is huge amounts of opportunity, um, but we are going to have to work differently and think quite differently to how we thought before. 
Um, but it is, it is about how, how do we provide confidence to our travellers and to the corporates um, and add even more value as TMCs or continue adding value because because TMCs always have. Of course. So if, if I could add, if I could just add one thing there because on the supplier side, I think we're going to need some more help from the suppliers. Um, and, and I mean to the corporates directly. And so we haven't talked a lot specifically about the groups and meetings market, but um, that's a good example to intertwine the, the role of supplier in that scenario. So we're seeing some activity um, in the group and media side. It's a big part of our business, actually. And one of our partners in that space also is reporting um, brisk sales on the, on the group side. Um, but where we're going to need help from suppliers is in contracting. So um, the corporates are going to need more flexibility in contracts um, so that they can be confident if they're booking a group that they're going to have the appropriate cancellation cancel, uh, opportunities should that become a necessity. A uh, really important um, part, I think, of that sector of our business. That's a great, uh, a great uh, question. And to move on to the commercials, I mean, I've just been looking at some of the questions that are coming in. We've got some really uh, um, excellent, high quality questions. So here's a question to you, to you all. This is from uh, Daryl Silver. And I think it's quite interesting. Are any of the panel uh, considering changing, uh, considering any changes in their pricing models post COVID for service fees or any of their income streams. Um, so, uh, Mark, let's start with you on that one. Uh, yes, <laughs> um, <laughs> we're, you know, not, not to be totally self-serving here, but any TMC or technology company or anybody who's on a transactional model, has got to be rethinking that 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 particular model. I mean that for those that didn't have a management fee type of approach, could be in conjunction with a transaction fee, obviously bore the brunt of the economic effects of no travel. So uh, that does have to change because TMCs were still providing services to their clients, really valuable services to their clients um, during this whole um, disaster and. Um, and, and TMC should be compensated, as should other suppliers. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering about the whole pricing mechanism, actually, because whichever publication you read or expert you listen to, we're either going to see prices going up in time or prices coming down because of supply and demand or, or dealing with uh, uh, limited uh, capacity. So it's going to be a, uh, an interesting question. Uh, uh, Mira, what do you think of uh, um, your business model? Are you going to be putting your fees up and prices up? We have just completed two tenders this week, um, even though there's no business at all, uh, because I think it's the company policy to tender out. And we have actually reduced, so we've given them two options of the management fees and just a service fee per transaction. And we've actually reduced them just to show them over this period, everybody has struggled and we know you're struggling as well. So we're happy to reduce the fees. And as and when business goes, we'll we'll review it again. But yes, we have reduced them. Yep. And and Diego, what what about uh, you? Have you had to re remodel your fees? No, we're not considering any changes at the moment. Um, we want to to give the best support we can to our customers at the same price as before. Um, we understand that maybe some prices will go up, but it's not on our side, it's from either from hotel or from different suppliers. But we want to, as I said, we want to be partners and we want to, we want to reduce their costs and to be profitable, of course, but uh, we are not considering any, any changes at the moment. Okay, and Julia, what do you reckon? Yeah, so Steve, so speaking to quite a number of our UK members, um, I mean, it's a different answer for, for obviously for every different business. Um, but I think the, the area that, you know, everyone needs to kind of relook really at is, you know, we, we don't know whether we're going to get a second wave, a third wave, a fourth wave. So current model for some, for some agencies, the current fee model isn't sustainable, particularly as Mark says, if you're just working on a transaction basis. So if you had to sustain, how, how is your business going to be sustainable in the future if it's just on a transactional basis? So looking at um, alternative um, income, revenue generating income lines, I think that's something that we'll be talking to members about. Um, and actually also attachment rates and thinking about ancillary products. How do, how do you make your business not dependable um, solely on one revenue stream? I think, um, so again, thinking dynamically, 
thinking about what what uh, what alternative content can you provide your travellers which are adding value um, but also think about what what more value can you um, provide your travellers by offering a wider range of content that is go obviously going to going to support income generate new income generation yeah, I, I think it's a really tricky uh, uh, spot for the industry to be in. I just want to get through as many questions as I can because we're literally down to five minutes and this has gone so uh, uh, um, so well in terms of the kind of questions we're getting in. Now, here in the UK, we've had uh, Heathrow Airport and now the government talking about something known as an air bridge. I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase, uh, which is where they'll open countries based on their uh, um, performance in terms of uh, eradicating COVID at both ends. Um, and the question I've got here is, uh, and it's come from a couple of different people, so I'm paraphrasing, but it says, do, panel, uh, do panelists think the air bridge idea is a workable policy? As we have been saying, there are so many different countries with different quarantine uh, policies. Uh, Mark, what's your take? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it is. I think, again, um, as I was saying earlier, from an experiential perspective, um, you know, people have to be comfortable. And, and I, I think that that type of process um, provides the degree of comfort that um, um, people would be looking for. So, um, so yeah, I think it's positive. Mira, is it workable, do you think? Yes, it is. I, I agree with what Mark says. Yeah, I think, it, I think it probably is. And Diego, what do you think? Yes, I think, I think so. And I may add that it uh, may help also in uh, terms of um, in leisure travel. Uh, if um, it, it can be helpful to many destinations, I'm, I'm thinking about Portugal, south of Spain, which rely heavily on um, passengers from some specific um, origins, like the UK, for example. And I think that would uh, help the economy of of the southern countries, and it, it may 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 help many others if many air bridges are open. Okay, and and Julia, but, uh, I'll ask you that question, but I'll also add my next question because I just will keep moving uh, along as fast as I can, and that is that in the UK, and I, it may well be across the world, but in the UK, I think it's it's a fair thing to say that the the industry has spluttered when it comes to talking to government and convincing government of just how important uh, travel generally, but business travel specifically, specifically is to the economy, to exports and everything else. Um, what, where do we go from here? And I know there's been an announcement that uh, the industry might get closer together in terms of representation, but why do you think the government doesn't listen to business travel and, it's, and understand its importance? Well, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Um... It, yeah, I, I, I wish I could answer that. I wish, wish there was a logical answer. I mean, it's really frustrating from our point of view, as you know. Um, so there are, you know, we work very closely with a number of other industry organisations and associations to really absolutely try and get that message across to government at the importance of business travel and travel. And for some reason, we're a poor relation. And for some reason, travel is synonymous with holidays. And as we know, it's not just about taking a holiday. Um, it supports, we support, we're, we're, on, we're, we're on an island. We're an island, should I say. And we support a global infrastructure. Um, it, we're a global nation that relies um, significantly on travel to keep businesses thriving and alive. Um, and why that message is just not getting through is beyond me. It's, um, I hear Diogo talking about Portugal, Spain, and I've seen all the announcements from different nations and the importance they place on their, their on travel and the travel community. Um, we just don't get the same look in, which is um, incredibly frustrating. So I think the, the, you know, the industry working together where possible on key, key areas and key messages and measures um, ha is exceptionally important. And we need to continue that. Could be the biggest learning curve of all out of COVID for uh, for the UK industry. Uh, Mark, does the American uh, government uh, get business travel and, and see it as important? Yeah, I think they do, but more more so even the overall economic um, parallels that you can point. I was I was just looking at the U.S. stock market, which opened up about thirty minutes ago, and um, it, it it had a huge increase already this morning, and and travel related stocks i'm just looking at um like the airlines are up four or five percent they were up more than that yesterday the market was up over two percent yesterday and over one percent today so i think the overall um 
uh, economy, you know, is, there's a synonymous, a symbiotic relationship between um, how the markets perform and ultimately what will happen in business and then ultimately what will happen in travel. But do, do leg legislators in the United States, uh, um, you know, do they have business travel as a, a top priority industry or is it as, as Julia? I, I, I mean, made? yeah, I think, I mean, I think travel overall, the answer is yes. I mean, the government um, provided a bailout for the airline industry um, to cover um, both the leisure and the corporate side, but they do recognize it, yes. Okay, uh, Vera, how, how's business? Oh, sorry, Julia. No, I was going to say to Mark, can we have his government? But then I, I, I thought about that twice, but it came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, be wise. Um, uh, so, so, Mira, um, uh, what about uh, in Kenya and, and that whole East Africa uh, region? Do you get much government support? Have you got good relations? With we do have good relations, uh, definitely, but currently, no, we're not getting any support at all. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. What, yeah. What's, what's For the them, it is to get over this pandemic. Yes. So course. everything else is, yeah. So yeah. travel for them is not, is not a necessity. Wow. Yeah. I guess that will be just the economic uh, tail that will be dragged through at the end, I guess. And, um, and, and seeing that, I mean, because we have tourism, we have we have a lot of tourism in this country, and it is a part of our revenue and our economic uh, status. So we would think it is important to them, but not at the moment. No. I guess it's priorities. Uh, and what about Portugal? What's the uh, the situation there? Is the, is, the, is the government mindful of business travel and its importance? Uh, I wouldn't say business travel, but travel in general. Um, because when you, it was like Julia said, there's not that many distinction before that that much of a distinction before um between uh, um, leisure travel or corporate travel or incentives of the groups and whatever uh tourism is very very important for portugal it's about 15 percent of our gdp so it's one of the main industries that um, that we have so travel is always very very important it's it's um much focused on the consumer and consumer rights and to defend defend consumers from mispractices so we have uh, lots of uh, legislation on that and many rules to protect the customer from bankruptcy of airlines from bankruptcy of travel agencies tour operators etc from if they want to cancel they can cancel so there, there's a lot of rules to protect them but not uh, many rules to legislate on uh, business travel per se so they are very, very concerned about tourism, very concerned about the, um, our national airline. Uh, probably the, it will be bailed out, but we still don't know. So there's a lot of debate on that. And the government is always um, very, very active on the okay. tourism and travel um, Okay. So it sounds like there's, uh, there's a, a bit of work for most of us to do there. Guys, we're almost out of time. I just want to end with one uh, last question. Uh, um, and thank you so much for being uh, so insightful for us today. Uh, and we'll go around uh, uh, um, the proverbial table um, and start with Mark. And, and basically, I just want to ask you, is there anything you've uh, uh, personally taken out of this period that we've been in? Any key learnings? either for you personally or for your business that you would want to share with, uh, with our viewers here today? Uh, yes. Um, I, I, and I, I've thought this before, but it's, it's just been more accentuated. And that is um, the bond that exists in this industry. Um, this is evidenced by this call. Um, you know, competitors working together, suppliers working together, and we're all in this together. And, 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 the industry has been so helpful to one another. And it's just, uh, I mean, I've been in this industry for more than 30 years. And um, one of the reasons I'm still in this industry, um, you know, it's just, it, 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 it's wonderful, the camaraderie and the uh, spirit of the core and um, yeah, people looking out for one another. Yep, it's a special industry in that respect. Uh, Myra, what's been the, uh, the key learning for, for you or your business? So in ours, it's stay connected with your clients and your staff. It's very important because they need to know that you are there for them, come what may. And also, also just, just be positive because we will come out of it. Good. For sure, we will come out of it and much more stronger as long as we're positive about it. If we, I mean, every single day, 
it's the same thing. Oh, these many cases and these many this and this many these. And you're like, oh God, no, I don't want to hear this. So at home, I actually do not sit and watch news anymore because it's just so negative. So just be as positive as possible so that it, it will go away. As long as you think positive, it will be fine. Excellent. Okay, Diego. I think what's important is, is to... To, to don't forget that we live in a world that's always changing and, it, and this year has been crazy. So with all this, the change, we have been talking about change for, for years and it's, everything is changing, the industry will change. We just didn't thought that was going to change like I this. Yeah. Yes, uh, but we need to, to stay together and to remember that our main assets are our clients, our staff, and uh, personally, here at Travel Care, we have great staff and they have been tireless and they have been helping us with everything they can. And, um, and we need to always keep in mind that uh, professionalism, attention to detail and the defense of our clients is what makes us a good company and uh, what's ma what makes us grow year on year and to be, to be a solid company, a solid um, travel management company. And for sure, we'll, we'll come out stronger than, Excellent. than before. Excellent. I think there's a, a uniformity there. And, and Julia, it's, uh, you've brought us all together through uh, WIN and the, the whole Advantage uh, uh, outfit. Um, so I think it's only fitting that we finish with you. If there's, if there's anything you uh, have learned from this particular period, both personally and as Advantage Stroke uh, uh, WIN, and anything you'd like to leave our, our viewers with today. Yeah, I think I think I've learned an awful lot in all those areas. I think you know, personally, learned that actually, you know, we're uh, there isn't a rule book. So um, you know, as a, as leaders, the the thing we need to do, and that our all our stakeholders rely on us to do, is um, is make decisions. And unfortunately, this episode has taught us to make quick decisions. So I think quick decision making, um, and we're going to have to make sure we're comfortable with that and make ourselves comfortable with that. Um, stakeholder collaboration, Mark and Myra, Diogo, Steve, you all mentioned it. It's collaboration is so important. And as I said, this for me absolutely cements the reason why we will absolutely continue investing in WIN um, and in our business travel and obviously leisure proposition and all we do um, really important and a stakeholder engagement will drive that. Um, the single biggest learning, I think, for me, on top of all of that is, um, is communication and the importance of really clear communication um, in a time where communication is being thrown at us every single second and, I, and maybe like all of you I can't even get to read emails nowadays there's just so much everywhere it's how do we make sure that we can provide that clarity and consistency of message in a timely manner that all our stakeholders get used to um, re rely on us and get used to receiving from us so that it it cuts through all the noise um, so and that's going to that's going to have to continue we're going to have to find ways of making sure that all our stakeholders right across the ecosystem um, are able to communicate with us in a, in a really effective manner moving forward. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, guys, thank you very much for uh, joining us here today. We've got quite a lot of questions. Uh, the whole session went faster than a, a, a gunpowder uh, flashed, really, because it just whipped past. So we didn't get the chance to uh, uh, ask as many questions as we, uh, we would have liked to. We could have done this for another hour or two. Uh, but my thanks for, you, for each of you giving up your time to join us today and, and to all the viewers at home that have tuned in to watch this. And um, that's all I can say. So thank you very much indeed for taking part today. And for me, Steve Dunn, uh, take care, stay safe and stay at home if you possibly can. See you soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.